The Lord be with you and with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. On the first day of the week, Mary of Magdala came to the tomb early in the morning, while it was still dark, and saw the stone removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them, They have taken the Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out and came to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple ran faster than Peter and arrived at the tomb first. He bent down and saw the burial cloths there, but did not go in. When Simon Peter arrived after him, he went into the tomb and saw the burial cloths there and the cloth that had covered his head, not with the burial cloths, but rolled up in a separate place. Then the other disciple also went in, the one who had arrived at the tomb first, and he saw and believed. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he had to rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, virtual parish, happy Easter. Christ is risen, alleluia. Indeed, he is truly risen, alleluia. And today we have much rejoicing to do. And that might seem very puzzling in this moment, on this day, because we are having to live this life of quarantine, that we are not gathered here, that there seems to be much darkness in the world. But that's not what Easter is about. Easter is the feast of a new creation, a feast of light. Because Jesus is risen and dies no more. He has opened the door to a new life, one that no longer knows illness and death. He has taken mankind up to God the Father himself. That flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, as St. Paul tells us in the first letter to the Corinthians. But rest assured, flesh and blood that we are, through Christ we have gained our place in heaven, in the kingdom of God. That a new dimension has opened up for us, for mankind. Creation has become greater. Creation has become broader. Easter Day ushers in a new creation for us. In order to understand this, we need to turn to the old creation of what happened there to better understand the new creation that Jesus has wrought for us in his resurrection. The two things are important here, particularly in connection with this celebration of Easter. That on the one hand, creation is presented as a whole. That includes the phenomenon of time. That seven days are an image of completeness unfolding in time. That they're ordered towards the seventh day. The day of freedom of all creatures for God and for one another. That day of rest. Creation is therefore directed towards the coming together of God and his creatures. Of God and his people. It exists so as to open up a space for the response to God's great glory, an encounter between love and freedom. On the other hand, what we hear is, above all, the first element of the creation account, that God said, let there be light. That the creation account begins symbolically with the creation of light. The sun and the moon, what we often think of light for our world here on earth, they're not actually created until the fourth day. The creation account goes and calls them lights set by God in the firmament of heaven. 
That in this way, God deliberately takes away the divine character that the great pagan religions had assigned to the sun and the moon. That no, they are not gods. They are shining bodies created by the one God. But they are preceded by the light. That they come after the light through which God's glory is reflected in the essence of the created being. That what is the creation account saying here to us? That light makes life possible. Light makes encounter possible. It makes communication possible. It makes knowledge, access to reality and to the truth possible. And insofar as it makes knowledge possible, it makes freedom and progress possible. That evil hides. Evil lurks in the shadows. It is something of darkness. The light then is also an expression of the good that both is and creates brightness. It is daylight, which makes possible for us to act in our world. But to say God created light means that God created the world as a space for knowledge and truth, as a space for encounter and freedom as a space for good and for love. That matter, that our bodies, the things of the world, are fundamentally good. Being itself is good. Evil does not come from God. Being made rather comes into existence. That evil only comes into existence through denial. Evil is a no. That at Easter, on the morning of the first day of the week, God said once again, let there be light. That the night on the Mount of Olives, the agony of the garden, that night, the solar eclipse of our Lord's passion and death, the night of the grave have passed. That now is the first day once again. Creation is beginning anew. Let there be light, says God. And there was light. That Jesus rises from the grave. Life is stronger than death. Good is stronger than evil. Love is stronger than hate. Truth is stronger than lies. If the darkness of the previous days is driven away by that moment, Jesus rises from the grave and himself becomes God's pure light. This applies not only to him, but not only to the darkness of those days. But with the resurrection of Jesus, light itself is created anew. And Jesus draws all of us after him into the new light of the resurrection. That he conquers all darkness. And he is God's new day. New for all of us. But how can this come about? How does this affect us so that instead of just simply remaining a word, it becomes a reality that draws us in? Through the sacrament of baptism and the profession of faith, our Lord has built a bridge across to us through which the new day reaches us, that light reaches us, that the Lord says to the baptized, says to us, let there be light. That God's new day, the day of indestructible life, comes also to us. That Christ takes us by the hand. That from now on, we are held by him and walk with him into the light into real life. And for this reason, the early church called baptism an illumination. Why was this? The darkness poses a real threat to mankind. That after all, it is the fact that he can see, investigate tangible things, but cannot see where the world is going, whence it comes from, where our own life is going. What is good and what is evil? The darkness enshrouding God, obscuring values, is a real threat to our existence and to the world in general. That if God and moral values, the difference between good and evil, remain in darkness, 
than all other lights that put such incredible technical feats within our reach are not progress, but also dangers that put us and the world at risk. That today we can illuminate our city so brightly that the stars in the sky are no longer visible. That is not an image of the problems caused by our version of enlightenment. That with regard to material things, our knowledge, our technical accomplishments, our legion, but what reaches beyond the things of God, the question of good, we can no longer identify. The faith then, which reveals God's light to us, is the true enlightenment. Enabling God's light to break into our world. Opening our eyes to the true light. That on Easter, the day of the new creation, the church presents this mystery of light as using a very unique, a very humble symbol. The Paschal candle. That this is the light that lives from sacrifice. That a candle shines in as, as much as it is burnt up. That it gives light in as much as as it gives itself. And thus the church presents most beautifully the paschal mystery of Christ. Who gives himself. Who bestows the great light. And secondly we should remember that the light of a candle is fire. Fire is the power that shapes the world. The force of transformation. And fire gives warmth. Here, too, is the mystery of Christ, made newly visible. Christ, the light, is fire, burning up evil, reshaping both the world and ourselves by his grace. And whoever is close to Jesus is close to the fire. And this fire is both heat and light, not a cold light, but one through which God's warmth and goodness reach down to us. But the paschal candle has its origin in the work of bees. It's made out of beeswax. And so a whole of creation plays its part in this mystery. Then the candle, creation becomes a bearer of light. Then the mind of our church fathers, the candle also has some some sense of containing a silent reference to the church. That the cooperation of the living community of believers in the church in some way resembles the activity of bees. That's what they go and say about us, the church father. We're like bees going out. That's what we do. That we build up the community of light. And so the candle serves as a summons to us to become involved in the community of church whose reason for being is to let the light of Christ shine upon the world. That's why when we are baptized, after our baptism, the priest goes and lights the baptismal candle from the paschal candle, gives it to us, that we share that light of Christ. That the true light enlightens the world is not the Son, but Jesus. His resurrection has scattered the darkness, brought us the true light. And many times in the Gospel of John, Jesus reminds us that he is the light of the world. That the image of Jesus on the Shroud of Turin, the burial cloth of Jesus, is quite literally formed by the light of Jesus. That we can go and look at the history of the Shroud of Turin, look at what has been said recently about it, how skeptics have proposed many theories of how that image of the crucified man got imprinted on that shroud, thinking that it is a fake. But the image is not made by a pigment or paint. It's only on the very surface of the cloth fibers. It doesn't penetrate the fibers. That those of us who believe in the Shroud of Turn as that burial cloth of Jesus can go and explain that science has gone and explained that the formation of the image on the cloth is like something of radiation put the image on the cloth at the moment of Jesus' resurrection. That the image of Christ might have been burnt into those upper layers of the cloth by a burst of radiant energy, a bright light. 
It's been described kind of as like a nuclear blast emanating from the body of Jesus itself. That the light of Jesus at the moment of his resurrection left us his image. That the woman go to the tomb early on Saturday morning, but Jesus was not there. That the angels told them that Jesus is risen. That the women, the apostles and disciples would later meet the risen Jesus. For us, sharing in the resurrection of Jesus, meeting the risen Jesus is not just something we hope for in the future. It is also for us now, in this moment, that Jesus offers life now. That the new life of the resurrection is for now. And we don't want to miss the offer of Jesus' life to us now. And we don't want to waste life. We need to live our lives with our Lord. Live the life of Jesus now by spending time praying with him in our homes, coming to our church to pray before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, that we can dwell with him in our hearts, that we can live out the great joy of the resurrection, that we can show the world the light of Christ that we received on the day of our baptism. Because we have a God who is alive. We have a God who has conquered sin and death through his passion, death, and resurrection. That Christ truly indeed is alive. Alleluia.